Thank you very much. My name is Vladimir Zeyan. And first of all, I would like to thank organizers, Newspec, and particularly Adrian for making this special event happen. And since this is a special event, I decided why should I present something uh, usual like my recent publications, if you can read them uh, on your own. Instead, I decided to make uh, some presentation in a workshop spirit, and also I believe that the science should be more altruistic. So we should share not only results, but also some small know-hows which can make our life easier and which could lead to uh, maybe future uh, scientific discoveries. So I decided to share my t tips and tricks, which I learned for the past, let's say, seven years of using SNOM system. And the title says advanced Neospec user, which means it's targeted for the users who have some curiosity to go beyond of just pushing buttons. If you want to learn how it works, if you want to go deep, um, that's what I'm also myself doing. Uh, and yeah, let's go forward. So that's the outlook. I would tell you some tricks how to reduce the noise, uh, some also small uh, tips and tricks, uh, data processing. And at the end, if we will have time, I will retell my recent publications, which are not yet published, but they will soon be published. So let's move on. And by the way, I want to mention that the near near spec system, it's a very unique and very nice system that it works the first day uh, after installation, but at the same time you can modify it and you can modify it on your own. If you know what's going on there, you can change it and do a lot of interesting stuff. And um, one of such uh, things is a detector which you use. Um, of course, you probably, when you buy system, you buy a detector. You can also ask Neospec what detector is the best. But you might also at certain point think, okay, maybe I can use my own detector or maybe I can improve detection by changing detector. So which one to buy? Uh, detectors differ by the area of detection. So there are large area detectors but they have large noise, and small area detectors, which have small noise. And here my advice is to, instead of choosing the detector, use both. Use large area detector for alignment and small area detector for measurements. And the noise difference is actually substantial, maybe by a factor, well, here by the numbers I can see a factor of five, a factor of 10, uh, you can reduce the noise from detector. Another important parameter of detector is again, because sometimes the uh, source is very weak and then you need to amplify the signal. But uh, uh, for the price of amplification, you need to pay with the bandwidth. And then remember that in near spec system, you demodulate at high harmonics, uh, preferably at third and fourth harmonic, and therefore you should pay attention to the bandwidth of detector. And it should be for uh, fourth harmonic detection, it should be above one megahertz. Therefore, you cannot just uh, use whatever amplification you like. It's only a small range of amplification which you can use. Yeah, another important parameter of some detectors which you can buy is AC coupled detectors. So what's that? I guess um, maybe some of you don't know what does mean and whether it's good or not. So the usual detector work uh, as following. It has a photo current from the diet and then it simply amplifies. And then the uh, signal is, has very large DC offset because you have simply the intensity from your reference beam. And at this DC offset, you have small modulation introduced by the interference with a small scattering by the tip. So that's how the signal looks like. Uh, and that means that you have um, basically low dynamic range and you cannot amplify it further because you reach saturation of detector. Therefore, the solution would be to use AC coupled detectors because first it removes this large DC offset and it only measures, well not measures, amplifies the variation in time, which will, in our case will be uh, modulation introduced by the interference because of scattering of the tip. And then it amplifies and then uh, with AC detector you have no issue with saturation because this interference is very small. You can amplify as much as you want 
well, until you reach the bandwidth limit. So here the advice is simple, use AC coupled detector. And if you're lucky, uh, if you have this detector on the market with a switch, then the one with AC-DC switch is the best choice. Uh, the final uh, tip about detection is a little bit more complicated, but if you use it right, you will gain really a lot because it will help you to reduce the noise from the source. So let me explain you how it works and why it is important. So if you have an ideal source, it has a constant power, like shown here, sorry, like shown here on the left. Uh, and then uh, if you put this uh, source into the SNOM, at the output it will be some modulation by interference because of SNOM. And then you, the system does demodulation and you get high signal to noise ratio. But that's not always the case. That's in general not the case because there is always some noise in the source. And some sources are good, they are approved by the near spec. Some sources are kind of bad, they have a larger noise. And then when there is a noisy source, this noise sum, sums up to the detection, it goes into interference pattern, and therefore uh, after demodulation you will get basically low signal to noise ratio. Uh, and there are two ways to decrease this noise from the source. So one option is to have high speed power stabilizer, or which is also called noise eater. But the issue is the same as before with detector, is the bandwidth. The bandwidth should uh, allow you to have this high frequency demodulation, so the bandwidth should be above one megahertz, and currently there is no such power stabilizers on the market. Uh, therefore, the only option you have is bounce detector, or bounce detection. So here, how it works in a usual way. So you have your laser running from the left, then you take a small, a bit of power from the laser and guide it to the first detector of this bounced. And this bounced detector, they have basically two photodiodes inside. So you guide small part of your initial power into first detector, and then the, whatever is left, you guide it into SNOM and get the output from the SNOM to the second detector. So the first photodiode will detect simply the laser power with the noise. The second one will detect the constant DC background because of uh, large reference beam intensity with the same laser noise plus some modulation because of uh, interference with uh, uh, scattering by the tip. And then this bounce detector, what it does, it subtracts one signal from the other and then it amplifies this difference. That's called a bounce detector. And then at the output, what you would get is no diff C offset and no source noise. And it really allows you to decrease the noise, what they say, by 30 dB, but it's, uh, sometimes it's really a big improvement. And uh, um, that was previous schematic. It was just general case how you uh, use your bounce detector. But in transmission module, uh, it is uh, so much natural to implement this bounce detector. Uh, and I will show you later. But first of all, I'm wondering if there anyone here who knows how transmission mode or transmission module of NeoSpec works, because I feel like uh, everyone here uses reflection mode. Is there anyone who knows about transmission? Okay, at least two, three people. But for the rest, I can explain you quickly what's the difference with our usual reflection mode. In the reflection mode, you shine the light on the tip and collect scattering, and there is some uh, reference sum for the interference. In transmission mode, you shine the light on the sample from the below by using another par parabolic mirror. And then the top part you use only for the collection of the scattering from the tip. And here in transmission mode, there is also an uh, interferometric detection and reference arm which modulates the phase of the reference beam. And here, the natural way to implement bounce detector is to use the second beam splitter, which its primary goal to combine this reference beam and uh, scattered beam uh, to make this interference. But it has two outputs, and both outputs they uh, give interference, and 
um, the funny part that uh, the interference term, it comes out of phase in one arm compared to the other. Therefore, if you use bounce detector in this configuration, you will not only uh, remove DC offset and remove the source noise, but you will also increase the signal because you will uh, harvest the inter, uh, interference uh, term, uh, interference part also, uh, which goes to the other arm of this beam splitter. And that's how it is implemented in my setup. The bounce detector I use is this one, it has two photodiodes which are mounted inside the box. They are very close and it's a little bit uh, difficult to work it in, to guide and focus the light with free space into each of the detector. So instead, the easiest way is to use multimode fiber and then guide each uh, optical output into multimode fiber, like shown here. I use parabolic mirror to couple to still have it broadband and then guide this multi-mode fiber, guide this power into the detector. Yes, there is also some ways to improve the source. Uh, if you want, for example, to uh, also reduce the noise is to use optical isolators. Sometimes it doesn't make huge benefit, but sometimes it makes a huge benefit because it uh, removes back coupling into, into laser cavity and some lasers become really unstable when you have some back reflection into the cavity. Um, another improvement for the source is to use fiber coupled source and fiber collimators. And the best way is to use reflective collimators. That means that if you will have several fiber coupled sources, then you can use the same reflective collimator. And this will give you the um, very good spatial coherence, um, almost uh, perfect spatial coherence because it will be a nearly pure Gaussian beam coming out. Uh, and this, if you use reflective collimator, it will be still broadband solution. So that's, again, that's what I use in my lab. And if you don't have fiber coupled source, if it's free space, uh, coupling into fiber, it's yeah, it's quite easy. You just need to buy fiber, objective, and some stage for alignment, and that's it. Yes, so a couple more small tips, which uh, I think they uh, still make some uh, difference, uh, still helps for my everyday work. So plasma cleaning, and the answer, whether to use it or not, yes, definitely yes. It removes all the crap from the sample. So unless your sample on its own is a crap, then better, you better use it. The next uh, issue which sometimes happens when you have the electric samples is uh, some charging. So some uh, charges appear on the sample on the electric and they are not uh, removing and then this electrostatic force, it uh, introduces some force to the IFM feedback and then the IFM becomes worse and the optical near field signal becomes worse. So you need to decharge the sample and for this uh, way you can use ionizer and they are pretty cheap. I use the one on the left which is very small. I Actually I wanted to put it into the box, into the near spec box to have measurements during ionization. This is still ongoing but you can also buy this tabletop uh, or bench top uh, ionizer like the one on the right and they are really cheap and makes it really a good job. Then next small tip, if you have many students or many guests in your lab and you need to explain what's going on there, the way, one thing which I did recently is uh, replace the top um, cover with a plexiglass, with transparent cover. And there you can see what's going on inside the box because otherwise it's just a black box. And then you can draw rays, how the light goes in, how the light goes out. We can put labels. It really makes, uh, especially for students who want to know how it, it works inside. Then next, okay, it seems like my time is coming out. <laughs> uh, Available during the demo session this afternoon, right? Uh, yes, at least for a couple of hours there will be time. Uh, but uh, this is, uh, I hope I will 
be able to talk to you about this data processing because I found it important. So many people here use uh, uh, FTIR, which means Fourier transform, but I still feel that not everyone understands what Fourier transform does and what how it can be uh, improved. So imagine that uh, you uh, image some decaying uh, mode, it's like a, a decaying exponent, uh, as simple as this one, and you measured a few oscillations of this decaying exponent. So if you would measure infinitely long decaying exponent without noise, without everything, and do Fourier transform, it will have this ideal Fourier spectrum, where the position is exactly where the real part of propagation constant sits, and the, the width is proportional to the imaginary part of propagation constant. But in our real life, we don't have infinitely long measurements. We have only just few oscillations. And if we do discrete Fourier transform, we will get this spectrum with blue points. So we have only few points around the peak. And as you can see, the position of the peak is not well um, resolved. And also the width is not the true width uh, defined by the losses. And uh, this discrete Fourier transform uh, to kind of have an idea how it works, you can imagine that you have a repeatable signal like the one you have and you uh, repeat it again and again and do Fourier transform of this infinitely long spectrum. And uh, it's clear that this is not the true mode which you would expect from just one e decaying exponent. So this discrete Fourier transform it doesn't give you the proper uh, information about the signal about the mode. You can do high resolution discrete Fourier transform and that's actually what uh, none of tier does. I think it does twice as much resolution and the trick is to add some zeros at the end of the signal. Uh, and then you get a little bit more points and the position of the peak is a bit better resolved but again the width of the peak is not the true width defined by the losses of the mode. Um, so one uh, thing which I found very useful is this extended discrete Fourier transform. Uh, you can Google it. Uh, there is a script uh, uh, for MATLAB uh, wrote by this Vilnius Lipnis, and it basically uh, does the magic. It's uh, for me. It's like a black box. You push button and then get nice solution. So what it does? It's iterative uh, program, and then after each iteration, it tries to fill unknown parts with what it predicts to be the true behavior of the mode. And then, of course, it you uh, use you put as an input how many um, amount of points you need to uh, like. Uh, ec extrapolate your data and then for example in this case it was five times longer signal and then it needs to be also uh, periodic so this was original signal then it interpolates a little bit with pretty what looks pretty much decay and exponent and then to get to another period it goes up again but what eventually it does it produces